Okay, in this video I want to go over the specifics uh, of your zine and with a special attention uh, on part two. Um, there's going to be four total parts now that you've completed your brainstorm, uh, so I want to get to those uh, right away. So, um, all you're really doing in the brainstorm is just for the first time, right, thinking about a public legal topic, uh, and probably given that this is election year and given the injustices that have uh, been going on over the last couple of years, um, it's, you know, probably a lot of ideas came to your mind, and now it's just about narrowing down to a single topic. And then today I'm going to teach you how to use the language um, by learning the language first. So uh, part one you can kind of think of, let's just kind of think about language a little bit differently than you've done uh, in your other classes, uh, and then think about how you're going to start to use the language uh, in the specific context of the law. After that, uh, you'll start to see what the logic is uh, and be able to identify a legal context uh, in the effort to measure change within uh, society using law. Uh, and then finally, uh, your test, right, the, the thing you'll be most graded on will be whether you're able to apply this legal reasoning. Uh, so these are kind of the three steps that will get you to what's called the abductive process. Uh, and so each of these uh, will be kind of a, a way of breaking down your project so that you can take it one step at a time. Um, I've found in the past that if you try to do too much too fast, uh, students kind of just can't do it. So in this way, I've broken it down into pieces uh, so that everybody's kind of on the same page. So I'm just going to use the four readings that I've assigned to you uh, just to pull out the language to kind of teach you how to do this. Um, this is not something you're going to be perfect at the very first time you do it. Um, but if I show you how to do it and then you start trying to do this in your research uh, and in the final readings I give you, uh, I think you could probably get good at this, um, you know, assuming that you practice, uh, by the time that the semester is over. So the four uh, readings, I just want to give you a context. So the fire this time is really about legal resistance as constituted by the abuse of legal power or control. Um, and then Blackstone's commentaries were about an organized approach to make the common law more understandable to non-judges and non-politicians. I also wanted to, you know, through that reading, introduce to you that the common law uh, might be new to most of you, uh, but that is the majority of quote-unquote law in America. So it's not really actually what Congress passes, right, as bills. Those are not the law. Uh, and a lot of students, at first in criminal justice, make the mistake of thinking a police action is the law. Uh, that's also not the law. Um, so this kind of very complicated thing called uh, common law, I hope you, know, you got an introduction to in the Blackstone Commentaries. Uh, and then I'm going to try to get you a little bit deeper into that concept uh, for the rest of the semester. Now, I think for most of you, from what I read, the Judiciary Act was pretty straightforward to you. Uh, and a lot of you, uh, I was surprised, a lot of you were able to see the contradiction that the Judiciary Act kind of set up a legal system um, that has not really done what it's supposed to do. Uh, and so I'm glad that you were able to see that. Um, and then that brings us to the politics of rights, uh, which is an empirical study, you know, not based on the ideal, but based on the real lived experience of folks um, to try to better explain this gap and how it, how it actually persists. The fire this time, you know, if you just look at, I've pulled out in bold these kind of like main points, and then I want you to think about this concept of constituting or reconstituting. And those of you, there's like nine of you, I think, who are in my constitutional law class, I hope this now kind of makes that class make a little bit more sense, because uh, we're going to keep using this word constituting, constitution, constitutional, right? They're all the same concept. But what the author was really getting at was that, you know, it's really... You know, the, if you're thinking about legal resistance and what the law can do and whether it's possible to have kind of equal rights, um, it really has to start with young people. And I hope that what you're able to see from this is that law does not exist outside of humans. And so as humans are born and die, each generation kind of makes the decision of whether they want to give equal rights to each other. Uh, I think it's very obvious that the baby boom generation... Um, and there's lots of empirical research you can do on, about this, but from wealth uh, to the laws to the fighting and bickering in, camp, in politics and in, in the campaigns uh, has decided that they are not interested in equality. Um, and that obviously hurts younger generations um, 
you know, Generation Z and my own generation, millennials. But we also have the opportunity to kind of learn from their mistakes. Uh, and so that's, you know, what kind of education and public education is all about, is trying to think about, okay, what are we going to do next now that we'll be coming into power? So this author's advice was to think about, you know, if you want to carry the abolitionist banner, meaning that uh, there should be no slavery, that people should not be treated unjustly, uh, that we should strive for equality, um, you have to understand that you are the agent of transformation. It's not the quote-unquote government or the economy or some external force that's going to save you uh, or intervene. You have to be part of that change. And so what this author was trying to get folks to see, young folks to see, is you have to expose lies uh, that, are, that exist in the narrative about law. And then you have to speak directly to the people, right? So talking back, resisting power, and telling the rest of us that we've always been the authors of our own freedom was a main kind of focus in the Civil Rights Act. It's also been the main focus in the Revolutionary War, uh, and, and you could kind of go throughout history and look at this kind of uh, understanding that when people in power have gone too far and abused their power, uh, that is what provokes people to go out into the streets to rebel, to revolt, uh, and to resist. And so that's that kind of um, back and forth tug of war that kind of gets us to this place where we can reconstitute a nation, uh, a community, uh, or even a neighborhood, uh, and that's what creates a revolution against that law, right? The law as an abuse of power, the law as uh, an oppressive law or an illiberal law, uh, and the culture that says that property is more important than humans. Uh, and as you you know might think about this, there's a speech that Abraham Lincoln gave uh, where he brought this up during the Civil War. So this is a thing that kind of presents itself to each generation. Um, and again, you can see what the baby boom generation has done. They have decided that property uh, is more important than humanity. And, and that is so clear in this pandemic, um, where, you know, folks in power have said, you know, well, you just kind of have to get used to the fact that people are going to die. So they'd rather reopen the economy and make sure that they keep their stocks uh, going up uh, even though that doesn't help average Americans, um, you know, as opposed to thinking that every life matters. And so I think, you know, you don't have to believe that, uh, but if you want equality and you want people to be treated equally, uh, then you're going to have to believe that. So if you value property over humanity, then you don't believe in equal rights, and you should just come out and say that and not try to pretend that you're uh, for democracy. So... Then we kind of think about Blackstone and how does this relate? Well, Blackstone was the first legal treatise to contain an orderly arrangement in logical, understandable language of the vast untidy collection of poorly stated principles and decisions constituting the English common law. In other words, there was all these actions that had been uh, written down, had been kind of filed away in different places. Then there was like narratives that stories that people would tell in their neighborhoods. There was custom, there was habit, there was routines. Um, but nobody had taken the time to actually organize that information. Um, in some ways, it's what I'm trying to do with you now, is take this like untidy, very unruly kind of set of things that are going all over the place and bring them into some kind of very presentable format so that you can start to see the relationship between these two extremes, that one on the one hand is anarchy uh, or abusing power for the sake of private property, uh, and then on the other side is this kind of collective action uh, where people want equal rights but are incapable of getting the power away from the other people. So we want to think about, well, what, what are the principles uh, and how do we make decisions within that kind of arrangement? And that's what uh, Blackstone was most famous for doing. And as many of you saw, that his work was very uh, informative uh, to what the quote-unquote founders wanted to do with the Judiciary Act. And so the two things that really stand out to me uh, that show this are that, you know, we had 13 colonies that had 13 different laws. If you think about the pandemic, we have 50 different states all doing 50 different things, and, and that's why the situation isn't really getting any better. Um, and so, you know, that's, a comp that's the anarchy there, right? Where each state is kind of looking out for their own interest. Everybody's trying to accumulate as much as they want. Well, that's never going to work because the states aren't going to be equal. So what they tried to do was say, okay, we're going to take the several states and you can have your laws except where those contradict with the Constitution, treaties that are made by the United States Senate, or congressional statutes, bills that Congress makes. And so 
you can have your own law as long as it doesn't conflict with that. Uh, and this is something that Donald Trump obviously does not understand. Um, to be blunt, I wouldn't, under, I wouldn't expect him to understand. Uh, he's not a lawyer. He hasn't been trained to be a lawyer. Uh, he was trained to be a businessman. Um, so he's not really, he's, he doesn't seem to understand the sovereignty of each state and the habits and routines of that state. Uh, and he doesn't seem to really grasp that the supreme law of the land uh, is the Constitution and the treaties. I mean, I think famously he backed out of the, the French uh, and, and English treaty um, about, uh, about climate change. And so, you know, it, it's, it's interesting that, you know, the Judiciary Act is, is, as you saw, not quite living up to its standards um, at a time when an entire generation seems not to be interested in enforcing the law anyways. So that really kind of goes to this idea of, you know, there was supposed to be a rule of law that was based on the decisions uh, in the courts, uh, and that's what formed the common law. And you can see that that seems to be lacking, uh, especially as the courts get more and more political uh, with these appointees. So that brings me to what is the job of a judge according to the Judiciary Act? Well, they're supposed to swear or affirm that they'll administer justice without respect to persons, and they'll do equal right to the poor and the rich, and that they'll faithfully and partially uh, perform their duties to the best of their abilities with the understanding um, of the laws, as we just kind of over, you know, uh, outlined. And then, you know, that would be in agreement with the Constitution, the treaties and laws of the United States. Um, and they even swear this to God, right? So this is kind of like a very serious uh, oath. And most judges I know take this very seriously. Uh, but what you see is like the politicians around them uh, don't have to swear this oath. Uh, and so you have a real gap between lawmakers, the police as law enforcers, and then the judges, the, the law interpreters. And so this kind of separation is very damaging uh, to this idea of equality. So that brings us to the politics of rights. And so, you know, in the civil rights area, in, in the civil rights area, it wasn't all a romantic, happy story. Uh, and I think if you were to take, for example, Deborah Schultz's class in history, uh, you'd learn that, right? It's not all about Martin Luther King Jr. and his speech. Lots of people were brutalized, were tortured, were uh, lynched, were burned, uh, were attacked by dogs, and the police were behind, you know, all of this. Uh, and obviously, you know, that's not universal, not all police in the United States, but there were police involved with those killings. And so you see this difficulty uh, in the 60s and the 50s and the 30s and the 1900s uh, where, you know, the, the law enforcement officers feel like they're doing what they're supposed to do based on the law makers. But then it's the courts that have to try to figure out uh, what's an abuse of law and what's a legal resistance. And so these legal and constitutional values neutralized some of the negative aspects like uh, op opposition to desegregation, but that did not turn into equal integration. And so, you know, these this work from the court had to then be channeled into political activity and institutional processes. So political activity is uh, protesting, uh, rioting, in my opinion. Um, and then also institutional processes like we're going through, education, uh, religious institutions, um, nonprofits, you know, kind of like these organizations, if you thought about it that way, and they start thinking about these issues, uh, many of them for the first time. But then mobilization of blacks escalated well beyond the boundaries of constitutional values and processes. Now, this has to happen, right? Because if, if the constitutional values and processes were treating everyone equally, there would be no need to mobilize black people, right? In fact, uh, we'd probably even start not seeing these terms, right? The racist society would be gone. Um, but as long as people are choosing to treat people unequally, uh, then obviously the mobilization is going to have to go beyond those bounds to make the point uh, that the law is not affecting everyone equally. And then finally, I want you to really think about this idea. The mobilization led to a counter-mobilization once the stakes of the conflict became clear. In other words, once white folks saw that they were going to have to give up some of their power, uh, they no longer were interested in black mobilization. And so you're seeing that again today. Uh, I think the best way of thinking about it is when people who say uh, fund the police, um, as if the police haven't been overly funded since uh, the World Trade Center attack, uh, with no assessment and with no accountability, um, they seem to not understand uh, that that's not really the point of defund the police, right? It's not about dollars and cents. 
It's about how a society decides to spend its wealth and who gets access to that wealth and who gets access to the decision-making uh, process. And so as long as the conversation is only about police, uh, we're going to be missing the big point. And that's part of what the counter-mobilization does, is it takes a big, broad concept and then tries to package it in the least controversial way uh, so they only have to give up a little bit. Uh, so what you're seeing kind of in a handful of cities is they, you know, they, they say, quote unquote, they're going to defund the police. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means that they took some of the budget and they put it into something else. There's still no accountability there. They're still not bringing anybody into the decision making process. Uh, and in, by and large, we're not talking about uh, officers taking a pay cut. And so, you know, if you start looking at it in that sense, um, it was the Republicans who defunded education, where folks like me, uh, professors, have taken a pay cut, a literal pay cut. Uh, and it also defund reproductive rights, right, where people who were working, doctors who were working in those fields literally took a pay cut. Uh, and you, the defund the state, right, to limit the state budgets. You saw this with uh, Donald Trump and refusing to give money to the states uh, in the pandemic because he thought they were spending it inappropriately. Um, and so you see that the counter-mobilization is very organized uh, and sticks to its message. The mobilization, on the other hand, is coming from a very emotional place uh, and is trying to bring attention to these issues. So the conflict is not clear uh, until these two sides start lining up, sometimes literally and violently in the streets, and then you kind of have to make a decision. So that is just trying to explain that this is not easy, right? Politics of rights is not something like, oh, you had an injustice, oh, you brought it to court, now we can fix everything. So then we want to take these uh, verbs, right, or, or these verbs and nouns, and we want to kind of try to think about how do they fit within the language of law. Well, you know, I would put it this way, right, like this chief lesson from the past for the young people. Think about conflict. Think about the first legal treaties. Think about the English common law. And out of that, come up with some principles. What are the principles uh, that the English uh, common law really were trying to uh, get at when it came to controversies and conflict? Then focus on the decisions of people. Think about us as our authors of our own freedom. And then compare those constitutional values and processes to a logical lawyer vision. In other words, what is it that a lawyer is going to be able to see using these principles uh, as people are trying to articulate or talk about their own future. And then at best, that's likely going to neutralize institutional processes, meaning that the police will be less likely uh, to target black folks with all of this going on. Um, it's not going to put an end to it, and, and I think there's lots of reasons for this, but the one thing is that this conflict is not about prohibiting police officers from harming or targeting black folks. Uh, that would take, a, you know, a philosophical, religious intervention at that point. Um, but it gets back to restoring the legal and constitutional values. In other words, trying to reduce the gap from the inequalities between law as an ideal and law as real. So first is just kind of like almost like an alcoholic. You have to admit that you have a problem. So we have to admit, right, that the original principles of the Constitution have a problem, that they're not being meted out equally. And then we have to go through this process where we think, okay, how is a lawyer or a judge uh, going to be able to neutralize this kind of uh, abuse of power? Then I would switch over to thinking about just language generally and start to think, what's different about law's narrative, the one that judges and lawyers talk about, uh, from, say, pop culture, right? Like songs, uh, TV, movies, etc. And then, you know, especially how does that differ from what you see on social media? Well, I'll tell you one thing. Lawyers are never going to say something like pound, you know, defund police or pound Black Lives Matter. You're going to have a much larger story, a much larger narrative, right? And you want to think about uh, lawyers as mediators. And so they're going to have to see the conflict from multiple points of view, which will not fit into a single uh, sentence fragment. Uh, and so social media is a particularly bad place to get legal information, in other words. Then you want to think about the mobilization leads to the counter-mobilization. So the language that the mobilization uses, like Black Lives Matter, led to the counter-mobilization where people can say things like Blue Lives Matter or All Lives Matter. In other words, right, they're responding to this thing that these other people are doing. 
And that makes this conversation a lot more complicated because again, neither one of those phrases were legal statements. So how are they going to be reinterpreted uh, by lawyers and judges is a big question mark, right? And we'll have to sit back and kind of watch, uh, although we can kind of try to speculate now in this class. So by doing that, we're going to look back at history and think, okay, what was the argument for integration, desegregation, and separation? And then we want to think about, okay, what can we learn from the civil rights era? Uh, and this might require some additional research, uh, but you could go back and read that article again, and you know he gives three lessons to be learned. Then you want to think about how the mobilization of blacks, blacks escalated. And I would add that it's not just the mobilization of black folks uh, in this particular uh, iteration of social injustice. You're also seeing uh, folks who have experienced gender injustice, uh, cultural or immigration injustice, uh, and economic or poverty injustice are also joining forces. And so this is likely to get uh, more and more confrontational uh, unless... Uh, the political activity is able to incorporate all these points of view uh, so that folks who are already agents of transformation, including you, are able to participate in the process and the decision making. If that happens, then we would reconstitute our nation and you would see a balance again. You would see law come closer to the ideal. Um, if that does not happen, you will see a creation of a revolution against the law and culture exactly like you saw in 1776 and in the 1860s, and in the 1930s, and in the 1960s, right? As long as we don't, as long as each generation uh, keeps messing this up, uh, then you're going to see this over and over again. And the principle that seems to come to the front uh, is always that property is more important than humanity. And you'll see this argument will be uh, given kind of innocently. It'll say something like, well, we don't all want to be poor, uh, and so some people have to make more money. You know, th that makes no legal sense whatsoever. It's completely illogical, but it's a lovely social media uh, hashtag, right? Uh, and it makes it, you know, we, before social media, there was the bumper sticker. Uh, now social media is essentially a car, uh, but you can see a lot more bumper stickers. So if you want to carry the abolitionist banner, if you're against, you know, um, law enforcement uh, as a principle, if you're against the mass incarceration, uh, as a principle, if you're against slavery as a principle, you're going to have to think about how to help people see humanity as being more important than property. In other words, you're going to have to get them to believe that there's a security uh, in an equality of property. Uh, and you know that's hard for people to see because of law's narrative at the moment. Now we should think about this, right? This narrative of law does not come from 2020. This narrative of law comes from the 1100s. Uh, I think, you know, I don't want to make an apology, but I think in the 1100s, uh, before you have the Industrial Revolution, before you have electricity, before you have modern medicine, it might have been a scary time to live, right? And so private property, putting up a, a fence, right, having spears stick out of it, maybe that was an acceptable way of thinking about things. But now, as you see, like, what could you do by yourself against the global pandemic? What can you do by yourself to make money, right? Like, we need each other. It's so obvious that we need each other just to survive that this idea that property is more important than humanity is kind of absurd. Uh, so you want to think about how do you reframe the narrative uh, using these principles? Now, all of that was, you know, big, big, big stuff, right? And so you might want to watch this again. But again, I'm just asking you to take that legal language, use those words that I just gave you, reread those articles if you need to. Uh, I pulled the quotes directly from those articles. Uh, and then just try to use this legal language uh, in your presentation to frame your research. And so just, you know, right now, right, come up with a thesis statement. Say, so if you were thinking about criminal justice reform, or if you're thinking about law enforcement, uh, or if you're, you know, thinking about what I was just, just talking about, about Black Lives Matter, defund the police, etc., you know, just write down right now and focus on the controversy. What is the legal controversy? What is the legal principle that is at the heart of the argument? And then try to see it from three points of view. So I would put a little circle and I'd put whatever the thing is that you're thinking about. And then I'd draw, draw three lines, right? I'd say one's ideal justice, one's lived injustice, and one is judge as the decision maker. And so on that line, I would write, okay, what is the ideal 
uh, solution to this legal principle. And then what is the actual lived experience of the person going through the injustice would be on the other line. And then finally, look at those two lines and think like a judge. How would you bring those two things together, right? What is the principle that you could kind of uh, think about using uh, to narrow that gap between the ideal justice and the lived injustice as it applies to your concept? Then you're going to want to conduct your own independent research. Uh, and just keep track of your sources. I'm not, you know, if we were in the classroom, I could be a lot harsher uh, on the sources because I could work with you and I could point you in the right direction. Given that we're doing this over distance learning, let's just let it be free, you know, free for all. Let's just see what happens. Um, and so just keep track of your, your sources so that you can share them with me, uh, especially if I get something that's kind of fishy. Uh, I'd just like to know where it's from um, and that's it. But I'm not really going to, you know, harp on you uh, about what sources you're using. I just want to kind of see uh, how this works. And I'm really just curious, you know, I want you to find evidence um, that would support your number three, you being the judge decision maker. And so this could come from documentaries, it could come from YouTube, etc. And so, you know, I, I don't want to be too harsh again. Um, and then I want you to read more from the politics of rights and just, you know, think about what Scheingold is saying and how, you know, he was looking back at the 50s and 60s what's different now, uh, if anything, and what can we learn from that book uh, that would apply to this kind of project that we're working on together, and then try to use that language uh, that to your concept, right, to your actual solution to these controversies. So this is going to be now in the case of a Google form. Uh, I'm going to include this presentation in the Google form uh, so you can watch it again because I really want you to do well on this. Uh, and just do your best. I'm, you're not going to get graded harshly for this. I just want you to try it. It's kind of like an experiment. Uh, again, if we were in the classroom, we'd just do this right in the classroom, share it with each other. Uh, so again, I'm, I'm not going to grade you harshly. I just really want you to get into the habit of using legal language. Um, and again, you know, this is distance learning. So this is kind of the best we can do under these circumstances. Uh, but thank you and, and give it your best shot.